All right, how's everybody doing? This is round two. You got your energy in your bodies. Is there any questions from round one? Everybody's good with uh, ERDs, building all these things, using them, queries. Any questions on the concept of like joins <coughs> versus joins versus inner outer? Okay, good. Well, you guys are actually doing pretty good because I, I met a handful of you before and it seems like you've got a pretty good understanding on the basics so far. Bob's going to do lesson four normalization and what we're going to do is I'm going to start us off with uh, we have a part one and a part two of that uh, Australian fella uh, on normalization. Can you help us out with the lights please? As we've seen, relational database management systems are very powerful tools for structuring our data. However, there's nothing magical about an RDBMS. Just like any other piece of software, there's nothing inherent within it that forces us to use it correctly. We could use MySQL, for instance, in exactly the same way as we use a filing cabinet, a card index, or a simple file structure. The process of normalization are a set of formal disciplines which allow us to make sure that our database systems get the most out of the relational database model. The best way to explain how the process of normalization works is to take a look at a very faulty database and then apply the so-called normal forms to this database and improve the database until it's fully normalized. I'm using the library database but in a very crude and unscientifically formed format. If we take a look at the table definition here, there's only one table, the books table, that includes the title of the book, the name of the publisher, the number of pages, a size field, which allows us to get an idea of the size of the book, and the published, the year is published, the name of the genre, and the author's name. Now, there are a lot of problems with this table and the way it's structured, but let's first of all take a look at those features of it that violate the maxims of the first normal form. To begin with, there's no primary key. We need a primary key for a table to meet the conditions of the first normal form. We need to therefore add a primary key and we also have a problem with including the author name all in one field or one column. This is because when we come to run a search, for instance, and we want to search for Gibson, we will have a problem because we'll have to search on part of that column. This is, will be a very inefficient way of running any kind of search on that. So let's take a look at the first normal form version of this particular database. We still only have one table, but now, as you can see, We've created a primary key, and the primary key is on the title and the author surname. We've also split that author column into three columns, the author first name, the author initial, and the author surname. This respects the principle of atomicity, which is that each of the columns should be an atomic unit of data, that is, can't be broken down any further in the way that a full name such as William Gibson can be easily broken down into two names. There are still a lot of problems with the structure of this table. First of which is that the primary key is not, although it looks like a fairly safe one, Neuromancer by Gibson, 
is not of itself a unique identifier that could not, under all possible circumstances, be duplicated. We would be better off using the ISBN, which is the unique number that is applied to every book that's published. So we can incorporate that. Another far more serious problem is that we include the names of the publishers with every book. We're also including the names of the genres with every book. We're including the names of the authors with every book. So, although we may have five or six books written by the same author, we're going to have to store that author's name five or six times. This allows us to store the author's name spelt in a slightly different way each time, forces us to waste space, and allows for the kind of errors caused by duplication of data. It also violates the principle that the table should store information about one logical entity. Let's take a look at the second normal form of our database. And here we've broken it down into several tables. Now the ISBN has become the primary key, which is a much better unique identifier. The publisher column is simply an integer which refers to the primary key of the new publishers table we've created. The genre similarly has a numeric column there and the author has been completely removed from the books table. Let's take a look at why. We have the authors down here. The authors have primary key which is numeric and the three fields have been shifted into the authors table. If we scroll down a little, we'll see that the bridging table, Book Authors, allows for the possibility of more than one author writing a book. And the primary key there on the Book Authors bridging table is Book and Author. The Publishers and Genres table have helped us to split the data away from the book table. And here we have an example of inserting some data into the tables in this database. There is one other problem with the table, the books table as it stands, and that is the size column. Now the size column is very useful because it allows us to, at a glance, be able to split all the books in our collection or our library into smaller books, medium-sized books, or great big epic books. However, we're also storing the pages column in the same books table. And the fact that the size of the book, in terms of the length of the book, is determined essentially by the number of pages means that the size column is basically dependent on the pages column. This breaks one of the principles of the third normal form. So when we look at our final version of the database, we'll see that the size has been removed from the books table. And we simply have down here a sizes table which specifies the different sizes according to a name and then the lowest number of pages that go to qualify a book for a certain size. If we take a look at the insert statements at the bottom, the final three insert statements, we can see that we've actually entered the brief, regular, and epic, along with their definitions, as in the number of pages minimum that go towards categorizing a book as that particular size, are included as data, rather than hard-coded into the table. So we've gone through the process of taking the very brief and illogically ordered non-normalized table that made up the database in the first of these text files and taken it all the way to the several table arrangement of the database that fits the third normal form. There are other normal forms, but knowledge of these ones and the general principles behind them will suffice for basic database usage. 
In the next movie, we're going to look at some optimizations which you can apply to your existing databases or your databases as you're working on them in order to get more performance from your database structure. The uh, process of normalization is actually a way of organizing your database. The way of organizing your database tables and their relationships in a more uh, better way to to join the tables together and, add, and allow you to prevent certain anomalies from happening inside your database. So the act is actually uh, some rules and guidelines you go through. Each rule, each normalization form is, is, a, is another rule. Basically what you want to shoot for as far as in the business world is getting to third normal form. Once you get to third normal form, in most cases in, in business it's determined or it's, it's said that your database is normalized at that point. Now to get there though, you, all, you need to go through some uh, steps, uh, but in those steps that you go through, they'll ensure that uh, your database is uh, free of undesirable results, uh, duplication. Uh, it allows you to add more entities to your database without restructuring what already exists. When, whenever you got to restructure your database, think in mind too, you also then got to reconstruct every program that's associated to your database. So you want to try to eliminate those types of situations. So if you do add something, you're only adding something brand new. You're not adding something that got to change things around. Uh, also, you want to make it so where the, the database is actually informative to the people that's using it. Uh, for instance, you don't want to have to be going and finding a telephone number in an address table. You know, right off the bat, you're saying, you know, I'm looking for an address or I'm looking for a telephone number. Why would I look in the address table? So that also helps you uh, actually document what your database is along the way. Now, what does it really mean now when you start getting into the first number form and beyond the first number form? Um, basically, uh, you don't want your row of data dependent on another row of data, or you don't want columns in, in, in your row dependent on some other column in the same row. And basically, you want one atomic value in every column, in every row. So it's kind of like a spreadsheet. You want for every intersection, you want just one value in, in that cell. Also, um, in the column, you don't want to embed like hidden objects. Like uh, you don't want to embed some type of ID within the value of that column. So, like say if uh, you got a telephone number and you want to associate it to a specific color uh, customer, you don't want to have like, the customer ID and the telephone number in the same column because now you got to parse it apart and that can lead to uh, duplicates, that can lead to inaccuracies. So you want to try to avoid stuff like that. And following these rules will allow you to to prevent that from happening. So first normal form basically comes down to uh, you just want to remove any repeating groups. So we'll start out with something simple like I did in the video. Um, you're, you're just beginning, uh, you want to design a table for the first time. You know, you, you've got a customer, you got a name, you got a telephone number. Okay, we'll just lay it all out, nice and simple, nothing special here, nothing difficult. Looks cool. But then all of a sudden now uh, you start coming along and um, say, okay, your customer got two phone numbers now, not just one. Now you got a problem. What do you do with it? Well, you could kind of like a spreadsheet and just do word wrap and stick another value in there. But what happens in now your row got more than one value in it and uh, makes it you know, not too pretty and it makes it difficult to do select statements and updates and things like that. So, one thought is, okay, maybe uh, we'll break it out and each each phone number will have its own column. Okay, that's a nice start, you know. Just looking at it, that, that would solve your problem, is that having more than one value in, in a column. But now, whenever you want to start doing queries and, and doing updates and that, you come into inherited problems. Now you got to check both columns to see if uh, you got a number you're looking for. 
Uh, if you want to uh, enforce an, uh, uniqueness, now you got to search now is my value in this column and is my value in this column. Then you got to do vice versa because uh, the combination could be, you know, in reverse order. So now you got to go through several different looping mechanisms to determine all that. Whereas if you keep following all these rules, you can prevent things like that from happening. Then another very important thing with what you just caused is whoever you're developing this database for, you just limited them to just having two phone numbers. So what you're telling the person using your database is you can't have three. So one of the, one of the goals too of a database is to allow the person using the database to keep growing, to keep adding stuff to it. You don't want to limit them. And being in all or college students, you start you know, getting some unique ideas. You can say, well, maybe I'll just string the values together. I'm still back into one value now. That's all one big string, so that's only one value. Well, again, when you try to do queries on it, trying to find one specific number, now you got to parse that piece of data apart and check both pieces. So it's still doing something like that still is not going to solve our problems. Basically, that's what it's saying here is yeah, you're, you're still having difficulty answering simple questions if you arrange your data like that. So as you go through each normalization form, basically what you're doing is you're removing your problem data and putting it somewhere else. Every time you go through another form, you end up creating another table, another relationship. So to solve that problem with a customer having two numbers, you take all phone numbers and put them in their own table. So now your customer can have as many numbers as, as they want. Now as you go from one form to the next form, each form, when you start that form, all of the, the rule states that you got to um, live by the rules of the previous form. So in order to get the second normal form, you've got to have all the first normal form rules already in place. <clears throat> so we'll start getting into the second normal form here. So by itself, each column by itself really doesn't stand as a key. Now, first normal form says you've got to have a primary key. Uh, when you get the second normal form, not only do you have to have a primary key, you also have to have a foreign key. So just looking at any one of these columns by themselves is in a Canada key. And a Canada key is basically a combination of columns that could be used as a key that uh, would cause this data to be, that cause the values to be unique within the, those columns. So employee by itself really doesn't stand uh, as a key. Skill by itself really doesn't stand as a key. And location uh, basically doesn't stand as a key. So when you start figuring out what your candidate keys are, you combine the columns to come up with a specific unique value that would help you to pull out your data. So in this case, employee and skill in this table would cause would be a candidate key for you to use. But that still didn't solve our problem in second normal form, because <clears throat> now when you go, you got your candidate key, but the location itself is really more dependent on the employee than it is the skill. So in and by itself, this table still lacks in the second normal form. Again, each form you go through, I'm going to, what it's telling you to do is take the problem data out, move it into another table on its own. So that's what we did here. We took all, all the skills out because the location by its, you know, location didn't basically uh, relate back to the skill, so we pulled the skills out. Now you got employee and location. Then you got all your skills over here by, by employee. Now that basically gets you the second normal form at that point. Does anybody have an idea? You all went through the data modeling class, right? For most of you, anyhow? Okay, so just looking at this, we're in second normal form. How do you think we could get this to third normal form? Got any ideas of what might be used? Uh, the, 
table term was actually brought up a couple times throughout the morning here. Any guesses? Would it be a bridge table? Well, very good. That, that wasn't a guess. You can know this stuff. That's uh, what, basically what you do is you pull your skills out, make their own table with primary key, then in between you'd have an employee skill table that would link the two together. So that way you'd only have you know, unique values in, in both sides of the equation there. Have any of you uh, heard of the guy, uh, Mr. Cobb? We read his book. Read his book. Okay, so, so you know what he's all about. Then he, he goes back the whole way back to the 70s. So this stuff has been around for quite some time. So but basically, once you get to third normal form, what you're saying is the relationship in the, in the second uh, form, you, both tables are in the second form. Then uh, the dependent table, all the uh, Data attributes in that table are directly directly uh, related to any candidate key within that table. So if you look at uh, an example here, we start out. This table basically is, it, for the sake of the uh, example here, is in second normal form. Can anybody tell me why it's not in third normal form? As you go down through, as you start looking through the table there, your candidate key basically is tournament near. But any column by itself really doesn't have enough integrity to make uh, the row unique. So you, you combine your tournament and your year together to be a candidate key. Now obviously the winner, the winner is related directly uh, dependent on both those columns. But if you look at the, the date of the winner, the day of the winner doesn't necessarily mean anything about the tournament and doesn't necessarily mean anything about a year. Basically, this column here is dependent on the winner. So to get around that problem, what you do, pull the problem data out, create another table and get some relationships here. So when, now when you look at it to make the third normal form, you know who the winners are, whatever tournament, whatever year, you can find a specific winner. Now you can also go and query and find out all the birthdays of the people that won. Now we were saying earlier, um, third normal form is pretty much what we're shooting for. Uh, so we go through first and second. Third is where most business databases end up. Uh, there are some exceptions. Uh, you hit third normal form. Uh, there's some trade-offs you got to keep in mind too. Like uh, if you keep normalizing your data further and further down the line, you keep pulling out, making new tables and creating new uh, relationships. You can imagine trying to piece together a query or a select statement that has about six or eight, ten tables, and uh, you try to write a select statement to pull back each individual value one that kind of gets gets nasty so you gotta get your requirements you know based on what, what the business rules are at hand and you get what the trade-offs are but as you can see there's a lot more normal forms than just third but uh, for most instances what, what you want to shoot for is third anybody got uh, any questions or what about the class you took in already? Did you just cover most of this stuff already? And anything that you'd like to add or at well, that time you didn't understand? I don't think so. I was just going to say that one thing we were taught is that you can't look at a database and say, well, okay, these are the functional dependencies here. And so divide it up that way. You have to know separately. You can just say this dependency can't hold on this particular instance. True, and that's where like your exceptions can you repeat that can you, for the uh, rest of the folks. What was the comp the general idea there? Um, so one thing we were taught was that if you have an instance of the database, you can't know for certain what the functional dependencies are data related to each other. Just by looking at it, at your uh, objects at hand, your your 
bend the knees and hands, you can't determine what the functions and the relationships are between the two just by looking at them. Right. You, have, you can only say what can't be true. True. And um, that's where, like, your, your business rules come into play. Now, you've got to understand who you're building this database for. Uh, if you're building it for the school, then, then you've got to go and, and talk to the people that are going to be using, using the database from the school and see what relationships that they talk about. Like uh, I brought up earlier, professors and courses. Um, and one, one college may say, we're always going to have just one professor teach many courses. But then as we we're going through the exercise today, we found out, well, here, there's some class, some courses, you've got two professors. So depending on who you're building this database for is going to dictate your functionality and, and your um, relationships. Right. How do you want to do this? Do you want to pop it up? I'll hand it out. OK. OK. Was there some other, you know, some other hands up earlier? Yeah. Um, uh, I was just wondering, because we talked about voice cloud normal form. That was like the final form we got it into in our, our we had to practice with in our uh, class. It's got it in the voice cloud form? Yeah. Okay. Actually, if you, according to, we got, yeah, that's, that's even one step beyond what, what we were discussing or what the, the presentation had earlier. Yeah, I was just wondering, uh, I think what, what uh, our professor said about it was that it was like a little bit simpler to understand than the third normal form, which is why people used it, but then it just happened to be more, even more normalized than they realized. Is, um, that, is that the idea of it? That, to tell you the difference between what COD, uh, voice COD normal form is and third normal form. That's the, isn't that one the, the key, the key, the, the whole key, and nothing but the key? So help me third, find it. Third one's got it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And in, in COD we trust. That, that's number three. Uh, to be honest with you, I never got past third normal form in, in the businesses we deal, so I, I've never had to uh, dive into okay, what, what I think you're getting at there at that point is everything has a super key. You know, so everything, and, and we kind of did that a little bit. If you notice what we were doing in our, in our first few labs, everything had an ID that was a super key. So it's good practice that every time you build a table to have a super key in there and then you just connect via the super key and you're guaranteed that you're going to have at least a, a primary unique key inside the environment. And then again, as you're going up, then you still have to keep the relationships of all the previous ones so you don't want to have any repetitive data, you don't want to have any, you want to have atomic data, you don't want to have any repetitive data, and you want to make sure that everything is, is separated in its own columns you know, first name, last name, things like that. So as you're going all the way up, and then finally, if you want to just make sure everything has a super key, and then now you're just connecting via the key, as opposed to building a composite key, <clears throat> you know, so like maybe the key is, I think the gentleman used uh, ISBN. Uh, you know, Ari used the, he, you could say the key is the author and the, and the title. Okay, well, that's not a super key. It's a composite key, so you might want to build an ISPN or something that, is definitely going to be uh, you know, on every table. I'm not even sure. By the time you got down to six normal form, I'm not sure yeah. what you didn't know. Yeah. Okay, so, so Bob's going to go through this. Data. Data. We, have, we have three labs with three exercises for this. Bob's going to go through the first one with you, okay? And then that's going to help you in regards to exercising the other two on, on your own. So basically this this lab here, we're just throwing out some data here. Uh, we're going to use a pet and veterinarian health uh, report to figure out our data scheme here, our data model. So what we're looking at here is just some historical data of uh, pets and owners and procedures. So just to start off with, you got down under UNF. Basically, what's, we've got two different notations going on here. Uh, one, this uh, pet notation here is saying, basically, in each row, this is uh, the items in each row. And, basically, and when you get 